of giving you a, a conventional one way lecture where i am telling you about principles one by one and then talking about case studies which is something you already do as part of your course i thought what we'll do is just have a conversation amongst all of us uh on some of these principles where i can maybe from time to time share my own inputs and some of my own understandings about these these principles of natural justice and uh, most of the uh, work heavy lifting will be done by all of us collectively so that's the sort of the structure that i want to follow not a very conventional uh, one way lecture from someone like because I'm, there are a lot of people in this group who know more about this subject than i do and not the least of them is dr javed himself who's who's the hod for this for the department of law so uh, let's let's start with this discussion on on principles of natural justice and especially the role of the supreme court in in shaping the contours of these principles of natural justice in india so let me just share my presentation with you uh, guru uh, knows that i like to begin my lectures uh, with uh, uh, with powerpoint presentation guru can i just request you to allow my screen sharing so that i can share my ppt guru just uh, if you could just let me share my screen ha so i so i typically like to begin my lectures with memes because that sort of get uh, discussion uh, very interesting in, in 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 the class i i want to begin with a pop quiz there are three names that you see on the top of your screen anubis dike and justitia uh, any one of you who are also uh, fans of history do you know who are these three individuals uh, what, what do what do these three names signify anyone who can just unmute yourself and share the answer anubis dike and justitia so anubis is the goddess of justice in egyptian mythology uh, dike is the goddess of justice in greek mythology and justitia is the goddess of justice in roman mythology now these are all uh, uh, you know goddesses of justice and the idea is that uh, you know justice is embodied uh, in certain divine principles that there are uh, certain gods who ensure justice in society um, that that thinking about the importance of justice in a society has uh, you know has percolated both in western civilization and eastern civilization which is why one of the key concepts that uh, that drives democracies all over the world is this idea of rule of law the idea that uh, there should be certain limits on what the government in power and people with discretionary power should be able to do and if they cross those limits of their discretion and if they if they use their power in a way which is which is arbitrary then the gods of justice will prevent them from doing so right and so the importance of justice as a as a divine value is is a guiding principle in all societies where uh, where, where we put a limit on the power of the government and on the power of people who make decisions on on our behalf one of the uh, ways in which rule of law uh, you know operates in a society one of the ways in which you can we see the visible impact of rule of law in in a society and societies which are governed by rule of law is the principles of natural justice right there are uh, you know three principles of natural justice and uh, what i thought i'll do is i'll uh, share the latin terms for each of these principles and uh, sort of just see if we can get uh, the meaning the english meaning of each of these principles so the first principle is of course nemo debet essex judex in propria causa uh, does anyone know what what this what this is a principle mean anyone who knows the answer can just unmute and share the meaning of this principle uh, feel free to unmute and 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 tell me if you know the meaning of this principle nemo debet essex judex in propria causa sir myself myself saurav kumar pande ha ah, saurav sir it means no one should be made a judge in his own cause or the rule against bias correct which means that if you are deciding the rights of parties involved in a case then it is important that you don't have a personal interest in this right because the view is that if there is a perception in the eyes of the party that you have a personal interest in this case then even though your decision may have been actually correct the fact that there was some doubt in the mind of the parties takes away something from the legitimacy of the 
decision making process right so it is quite possible that i may still give the best possible decision i may apply the law exactly how it should be done in a particular case but if at the start of the case both parties get to know that i have some interest right then even though substantively my decision may have been correct because the perception is conveyed that there may be some some you know motivation for me to side with one party that takes away from the legitimacy of the decision making process and so to avoid such dilution of the legitimacy of the decision making process uh, one principle that uh, democracies all over the world have evolved is that you cannot be a judge in your own court but typically there are you know three important ways in which you can you can uh, have an interest in a case right one is uh, the first interest is uh, you know personal bias where you personally know some of the people involved in a case so let's say you are a warden of a hostel and you have to decide whether um, in a fight between two students uh, who is guilty and who should be removed from the hostel right if one of the students involved is your son or your daughter right then even though you may have applied the hostel guidelines correct the fact that one of the parties involved was someone close to you means that there may be a perception that you may have been a little uh, lenient towards the party whom, whom you are fond of and therefore to remove that perception if your son or daughter is involved in in a hostile fight when you are awarded you will typically be expected to recuse yourself and let someone else who has no stake in the matter uh, decide this case a classic supreme court case which sort of captures this idea of personal bias is the kripak uh, uh, in kripak uh, versus union of india the 1969 1970 supreme court anyone who's heard of the kripak case do you want to quickly share the facts just in one or two lines because that's one of the landmark cases on uh, on on natural justice uh, and one of course is the idea that the kripak case spoke about personal bias but there's another important facet of natural justice that the kripak case covered which i'll talk about a little later in the lecture but someone who knows briefly the facts of the kripak case can you just share uh, with all of us what happened in the kripak case so what happened in the kripak case was that uh, there was uh, yeah sorry someone was saying sir my name is rahul mishra sir ha rahul go ahead so the briefly side of this case was uh, that sir um, sir uh, there was a member in a board sir ha correct, uh, correct. In, a, sir, in in ifs board sir who was uh, uh, sir uske sath sir ye was sir wo board ka member bhi tha sir aur jab unki sir jab wo unki jab interview ki bari aayi sir तो उनके ऊपर ये आरोप लगाया कि चूंकि ये बोर्ड के मेंबर हैं बिल्कुल 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 तो वो अपने आप को सर वो मतलब वो सब्सिट्यूट नहीं करवा सकते वो आईएफएस के पोस्ट के लिए सर करेक्ट 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 तो जैसे उसमें क्या होता है कि एक चीफ कंजर्वेटर ऑफ फॉरेस्ट होता है जो भी फॉरेस्ट एरिया होता है इंडिया में उसके चीफ कंजर्वेटर होता है तो उसके जो एक्टिंग चीफ कंजर्वेटर थे बिकॉज जो इसके उनके पहले जो चीफ कंजर्वेटर थे ही रिटायर्ड एक्टिंग चीफ कंजर्वेटर थे तो वो बेसिकली उस समय इंचार्ज थे फॉरेस्ट एरिया बट एक सिलेक्शन कमेटी का गठन हुआ जिस जो कि अगला चीफ कंजर्वेटर सिलेक्ट करने वाली थी उस सिलेक्शन कमेटी के भी वो पार्ट थे राइट और साथ साथ एज एक्टिंग कंजर्वेटर ही वाज आल्सो कैंडिडेट फॉर द नेक्स्ट चीफ कंजर्वेटर सो इट इज अ क्लासिक केस ऑफ पर्सनल बायस वेयर आई एम बोथ द अंपायर एंड द क्रिकेट प्लेयर इन इन एन आईपीएल गेम इट कांट बी दैट आई एम बोथ एन अंपायर एंड अ प्लेयर इन अ गेम सो इसमें वही हो रहा था कि वो एज ही वाज आल्सो कैंडिडेट फॉर द नेक्स्ट अपॉइंटमेंट ऑफ द चीफ कंजर्वेटर एंड ही वाज आल्सो पार्ट ऑफ द सिलेक्शन कमेटी Right. so even though when his name came up he withdrew he said ki mera naam mein main kuch party rahe ho to main kya karu the fact that he was still sitting in the committee when his potential rivals names were being discussed right meant that there was a clear perception of bias now this is not a comment on whether he actually mr kripak actually uh, acted in a biased way against his potential candidates or not because as a member of the selection committee he has a right to express his view on each of the interviews of the of the of candidates who been shortlisted but the fact that there may be a possibility of a bias right meant that this was a clear violation of national justice and he, and he he was expected to withdraw withdraw from his from the from the panel so the important principle that i sort of find very interesting in 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 uh, personal bias cases is the question of whether there is a possibility of bias the question is one of capability not intent right your intention may be very good but if you have the capabilities to interfere with the decision making to interview interfere with the uh, uh, you know the judicial process in, in in a case you are expected to 
take a battery and you're expecting not to be a part of that. Another classic example of a personal bias is when you know one of the partners. Right. So there's a Singur case who I should remember with Mamta Banerjee when she was the opposition leader. There's this massive dispute around the Singur acquisition uh, by the communist government. So Usme jo judge, Justice Swamitra Pal, he knew some of the officials who were involved in the Singur land, land acquisition case. So he had to withdraw when this case went to the high court. Another very interesting example is uh, Justice Dalvir Bhandari. You know, principles of natural justice when I discuss in my course, the one case that I always mention is the Novartis versus Union of India. Novartis versus Union of India is a very important Supreme Court case in which the Supreme Court increased the threshold for what is patentable. So, unka ek, uh, Novartis is a very multinational company. Unka ek, ek, ek drug tha, uska wo extended patent maang rahe, 20 saal ke liye aur. Right. So, usme unhone kya hai, kuch kuch cosmetic changes karke kaha to Supreme Court ko ki abhi humne isme minor changes kar diye, to hume 20 saal ka patent aur de. Right. Supreme Court ne kaha ki nahi, aap kabhi bhi dawai pe patent maang rahe, so you can't simply make cosmetic changes and ask uh, for uh, a 20 year extension in, in the patent. Because that is simply an example of evergreening a patent. Koi genuine innovation nahi nikal kya. Right. So, if you want to extend the patent on a medicine, you have to prove that it is more efficacious. So, it means that side effect should be reduced, or its dosage should be reduced. Three weeks of dose, one week of dose, the patient will recover. Right? Or it will be reduced price. Or if the price, dosage, side effects are all the same, you just change some cosmetic changes, like the water of the distilled water, or the calcium or the magnesium. If you ask a simple, simple change, karke yadi aap patent mang rho, then it is not patentable. Right? So, they, it is a very, very important judgment from a public policy perspective also, because that allowed cheap generic drugs to be manufactured in our country, which could service a lot of patients both in India and all over the developing world. So, in the history of Supreme Court, Novartis versus Union of India is a very, very important case. Now, the reason I bring that case is because the decision of that case took a very long time. And the reason it took a long time is because a lot of judges who were appointed to this case had some connection to one of the parties. So, this is Justice Dalvir Bhandari, who was one of the original sort of judges appointed to this case. He had visited several international conferences. He had done several international conferences, uh, which were sponsored by the multinational companies, including Novartis, right, in the last few years. Now, that may or may not affect his decision in the particular case, right? But it can create a perception, right? Ki because a company ne unko sponsor karke bahar foreign tour mein bejai, wo shayad us company ke favor mein decision de dekha. And so to remove this perception of bias, Justice Dalir Bhandari recused himself uh, from, from, uh, from the case. The next judge who was replaced was Justice Matande Kadju, who was then a Supreme Court judge. Who, he became a part of the bench. Now, now this time, Novartis had an objection after he was appointed to the bench because Justice Matande Kadju, four or five years back, had written an op-ed in a popular newspaper saying that drug companies should, uh, you know, they, they charge an exorbitant price for their patent drugs. They should not be allowed to do so because it harms the interests of poor patients in India. So, he had a personal view assess about this particular issue, which was at the heart of the case, in, a, in an op-ed newspaper. And so the, now this time, Novartis feared that maybe because of his clear-cut personal views on the subject, he may be biased against us, that he may not apply the principles of law correctly. So again, the important thing is that it is a question of capability, not intent. The intent of Justice Dalvir Bhandari and Justice Markande Kaju may be to apply the law to the best of their ability. But that is irrelevant when you're looking at violation of natural justice. The question is of capability. Does this judge have the capability to act in a way that will take away the, uh, you know, the, 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 take away from the legitimacy of the judicial process? Dusra example of bias ka, pecuniary bias. Right. And typically this happens when judges have some financial interest in one of the parties. I mean, again, for, for some reason, Markande Kaju's case comes up because he was deciding this case between Reliance and DPCL. And uh, turns out that he had shares, his wife had shares in the Reliance company. So again, he, he had to uh, recruit him, recuse himself. Uh, Justice Kapadia, who was one of the great chief justices and a great uh, exponent of tax law, great jurist, you know, developed a lot of jurisprudence on Indian tax law. He was deciding uh, this famous Sterlite case in the Supreme Court. And turns out that he had shares in Sterlite. And so again, he had to disclose this to both the parties before he could go ahead with hearing the case. And typically, this is a common example where judges, you know, they end up having shares in a company whose case is pending before the Supreme Court and they are expected to, uh, to, 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 to withdraw 
network withdraw from those so, so pecuary bias is another classic example of the application of uh, the first principle of natural justice that you cannot be a judge in your own court the third way is if you are interested in a sub subject matter like justice mark index you wrote an op-ed on an issue that he was deciding and so he already made up his mind publicly and expressed this view publicly on an issue that he was hearing in a pending case so typically when you see these examples you know you say that this is a valid natural justice and the reason you flag this off is because if a judge gives his or her decision despite uh, public knowledge of their interest in a case, it, it takes away from the legitimacy of the process, right? and it, it, it uh, dilutes the 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 the, uh, the principle of rule of law in a democratic society. So, the first principle of natural justice is is uh, that you cannot be a judge in your own court. The second principle of natural justice is, of course, the most famous one: audio alter party. So again, this is a Latin version of the principle. So if you know what this Latin maxim means, just unmute yourself and uh, share us share with us what this principle means. What does the principle audio means? Principle? Hear the other party. Correct. Someone else who wants to rephrase this in a better way. Sir, hearing both What's, sides. Ah, you can hear hear both sides. Okay. Someone yes. else who wants to sort of further develop this idea. What does it mean to say that? You should hear both sides. Why is it so important that it's a principle of natural justice? Anyone else? Just unmute yourself, and you can and you can share your so, thoughts. So it means, sir, and no, no, no one who anyone who is the party in the case must be heard, sir. Correct, correct. That you cannot. There's, there's a way some of these judges phrase it that you cannot condemn anyone unheard. That if you ever take a decision that affects someone's civic rights, whether it could be it could be an action with civil consequences or criminal consequences, whenever someone's legal rights are being affected by your decision, right, you cannot take that decision without giving that person an opportunity to present their case. Right? So therefore, you must hear both sides of a dispute. Before you ever decide again. Now this led to one of the big debates about natural justice, which I'll come to a little later in the lecture, about whether principles of natural justice only apply to judicial cases or also to administrative cases. Because that was one of the first important debates that if you must hear both sides before taking any action, do you have to hear both sides before you decide to fire someone in an office, before you decide to take disciplinary action against someone in a university? Right. So. All of these are examples of disciplinary actions, administrative proceedings, not strictly legal proceedings. Right? So when you take disciplinary actions against someone in a university, or when you fire someone from an office, right? these are not strictly judicial settings in which you are exercising a judicial power. These are almost quasi-judicial administrative proceedings. So the big question in the 50s and the 60s, when principle and access justice, uh, so you know, was was an, was being uh, articulated in several important cases. One of the big debates. That arose in the 50s and the 60s was whether body alterum partum and other principles of natural justice should also apply to administrative proceedings and not just to uh, legal proceedings. But I'll talk about that a little later. I just want to focus on the principle itself at the start of the lecture. Uh, so, yeah, so the idea is that you cannot take a decision against someone without first giving them an opportunity to present the case. Now, this takes several forms, right? So, for example, you must give both sides adequate notice. Right. You must uh, give both sides an opportunity to present their case. You must, uh, uh, you know, give both sides the opportunity to question the people who are giving witnesses against uh, against them. Right. You must give both sides the right to file a representation. Uh, uh, right, file a representation before before the judge. Right. You must give the right both parties the right to cross examination. Right. All of these are important facets of the general principle that there should be audio alternate party, that you cannot decide a case without first giving both sides an opportunity to present their argument. So some ex illustrations and some practical ways in the in which the principle of audio alternate partum uh, manifests itself in our in our laws is by the requirement of giving adequate notice. Right. You must tell each side what is the evidence that is being relied upon to convict them. Right. You must give them a right to, uh, like I said, to ask for a lawyer. You must give them a reasonable time to file the reply. Right. Uh, you, know, you must give uh, you know, them a right to cross-examine the witnesses who are testifying against them. And finally, the 
people who decide the case should be the people who've heard the entire case. But you can't change judges midway before uh, you know before deciding a case. So you can only decide a case if you sat through each of the hearings for the for a particular case. And if even one of the judges is not available, then you know, and or if the, one of the judges has been replaced, then the entire case will be heard all over again. Which is why you see that when chief justices retire or when judges retire from the Supreme Court or from the High Court, right? The one or two weeks before the retirement, you see a flurry of judgments that come from from uh, the their, their benches. So whether it was Justice Deepak Mishra, Justice Gogoi, right, or Justice Thakur, all of these Supreme Court judges remember the one or two weeks before which they were retiring, in which they were retiring, right? Just before their retirement, uh, all of them come out with a flurry of judgments because if they don't decide a case which they've heard, it is a violation of principle of natural justice. And if a new judge replaces them on the bench after their retirement, then the entire case will have to be heard all over again. Right? Because not to do so would be a violation of what the also part. So the second important principle of natural justice is that you must hear both sides before uh, you decide a case. The third principle, which evolved in our country a little later, in the 80s and, 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 and uh, in the 90s, this was just a, a third principle, almost a corollary to the first two major principles of natural justice. But now there are several Supreme Court cases which acknowledge that this is a, a, a third principle of natural justice in India and then most of the democracies. You know. And I don't want to go very technical, but you have cases of S.M. Mukherjee versus Union of India, uh, Sri Jain versus Kudan Singh, uh, which is another Supreme Court case, where this third principle of natural justice has been explained. And the Latin maxim which captures this third principle is cessant rational legis, cessat ipsa lex. Anyone who knows what is this principle? What does this principle mean? Uh, sir, I don't know the exact meaning, but I think uh, it means that uh, your decision should be backed by reason, proper reasoning, and it should hmm. be speaking. Correct, correct, Vlad. This is this is absolutely correct. It says the third principle of natural justice means the Latin maxim which I have shared with you. It means that reason is the soul of law, and when the reason goes, and when, when the reason ceases to exist, so does the law. So you cannot call something law. You cannot call something an act of justice if you don't explain the reasons behind it. Right. And so how we translate that in our own uh, country is by saying that all decisions must be speaking orders. You must have heard this uh, sort of phrase in your, in, in, in your lectures also, that all judicial decisions must be speaking orders. We all in our law school study several cases. And if you notice that there's a particular format that every single case follows. right? And we don't take a step back and think about the format of a judgment because we straight away when we are studying as a law, as a law student, when we are reading judgments, we quickly jump headlong into into reading the facts, arguments, etc. But it's sometimes very interesting to take a step back and look at the structure of every judgment that comes out from a from a lower, lower court, high court, or supreme court. Every judgment typically has this format. At the start of the judgment, you mentioned facts of the case, right? He, Party A bolti hai, ye sab hua. Party B bolti hai, ye sab hua. Looking at rules of evidence, we believe that these are the facts of the case. Right? Then they say, okay, the issues of law are as follows. These are the important questions that have been raised. Right? The relevant laws are as follows. Party A argued these case laws, these principles. Party B argued these case laws. So therefore, the questions before the court are as follows. And then they, typically the judge will capture that these are the issues on which I have to give my judgment. And then Point by point, issue by issue, the judge says, okay, on this point, because these are the facts and this is the law, I come to a particular conclusion. And then it goes to point where it says, okay, on this issue, these are the facts, these are the relevant principles, these are the relevant case laws, and accordingly, I have decided this in a particular way. Right? And finally, because these are the issues I have decided either for one party or for the other party, I hereby order the guilty party to do so and so thing. Right? Typically, if you look at any court's judgment, this is the format they follow. The assertion of facts on both sides, then the judicial determination of facts, then the assertion of law on both sides, arguments for both sides, and the summary of the, of the judge on what are the relevant provisions of law in the relevant case law, then the issues on which judgment has to be given, then issue by issue the judge decides the case, and finally they give that the you know the the, the, the operating part of the judgment where they impose certain costs or certain actions on the guilty party. This is, as you can imagine, a very time-taking process. And one of the reasons there is so much pendency in our courts is that every judge, you can't expect a judge to simply hear both sides and then say, Ki, 
आई हर्ड बोथ साइड ये गिल्टी है ये इनोसेंट राइट कम टू थिंक ऑफ इट इफ द जजेस आर अलाउड टू डू सो इफ दे आर अलाउड टू राइट शॉर्टर जजमेंट आर जुडिशियल पेंडेंसी वुड एक्चुअली इंक्रीज जस्ट यू नो वुड रिड्यूस जस्टिकली जजेस वुड बी एबल टू डिसाइड इट इज मच मोर क्विकली इफ दे आर नॉट बाउंड टू राइट सच लॉन्ग एक्सटेंसिव जजमेंट फॉर एवरी केस दैट दे डिसाइड so there is a big cost that that our judicial system pays for insisting that every judgment of the judge must be recorded in this particular format that they in great detail they explain the facts law arguments and let it why is it that we pay this big price in a judicial system why is it that we insist that even though it is time taking judges must always explain their decision right because if they were not forced to explain their decision If they could quickly take the decisions and say, "Ki ha, I have done both sides. This is guilty." And you know, the kings and the rajas of ancient times used to do this. The rajas used to decide on the case. They didn't write these lengthy judgments. "Ki ha, I have listened to both sides. This is the law." They would argue both sides, and then they would immediately, instantly decide, "Ki ha, I have listened to both sides. The fellow is guilty. We should give compensation." So, this requirement that. a person making a judicial decision must explain his or her decision in writing and in great detail is a very recent phenomenon right for most of history aap dekho panchayat mein bhi panchayat mein jab koi decision hoti hai to thodi wo baith ke ek proper written judicial order dete so conventionally ye requirement nahi tha ki every time you decide a case you have to give a long self explanatory decision right there is a reason why we insist on doing so in our legal system right? and we must understand that the, the legal system pay the very high price for this on insisting that judges write their decision in great detail means that the rate of processing cases the rate of deciding cases is very very sort of slow right and that builds up the judicial tendency in a system right which delays us so there is a big cost we pay when we expect judges to give a written an exhaustive written record of every decision they make but still we insist that the judges do so right why is it why do we keep insisting that despite such a time taking process judges must always explain their decisions in writing what protection do we get what assurance do we get when we know that a judge has to explain his or her decision in writing anyone who wants to take a shot at it why do we insist on judges being forced to write their judgments anyone wants to take a shot रवि आप कुछ कह रहे थे यू कैन एनी वन कैन जस्ट अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ एंड देन यू कैन जस्ट शेयर योर थॉट वाई डू वी एक्सपेक्ट जजेस टू राइट द डिसीजन वॉट वॉट प्रोटेक्शन डू वी गेट एज सिटीजन वेन वी नो दैट जजेस विल वी हैव टू एक्सप्लेन द डिसीजन इन राइटिंग Anyone wants to take a shot? Atta, me. Do you want to just unmute yourself and share your thoughts? Atta, me. You can unmute and share. Atta, me. Atta, me. Okay. Anyone else? Right. So let me sort of summarize for you what are the two important reasons. why we insist that judges should explain their decisions in writing first is that it like what tanmay message in the chat box that it ensures accountability you know that the judge because he or she is forced to explain the decision in writing they have applied their mind to giving a judicial decision right you know ne ye basis pe nahi decide kiya ki mujhe falan aadmi pasand hai aadmi pasand iska chehra mujhe acha lagta hai iska chehra acha nahi lagta right isliye maine decision de diya क्योंकि यदि वो रीजन होता तो आप उसको राइटिंग एक्सप्लेन नहीं कर सकते थे एंड इफ यू अलाउड जजेस टू गिव वर्बल डिसीजन और नॉन स्पीकिंग ऑर्डर जस्ट वन लाइन ऑर्डर देन दे कुड गिव द डिसीजन ऑन वेरी वेरी आर्बिट्री ग्राउंड राइट कि आज मेरा मूड खराब है इसलिए मेरे को इसका चेहरा पसंद है इसलिए मैं इसके अगेंस्ट में डिसीजन दे सकता दीज काइंड ऑफ थिंग्स वुड बी पॉसिबल इफ जजेस आर नॉट फोर्स टू एक्सप्लेन द डिसीजन इन राइटिंग सो वन इंपॉर्टेंट एश्योरेंस वी गेट इज दैट स्पीकिंग ऑर्डर ensure application of mind on part of the the the, the person making a judicial decision so ek bada protection rehta hai ki the judge will not make arbitrary decisions because he or she knows that they have to explain their decision in writing so ab writing ye nahi likhte hote ki aaj mera main utha aaj mera mood kharab tha iska chehra mujhe pasand nahi tha isliye maine ye decision diya ya main utha aaj 
इसने इस जिस तरह से इसने आर्ग्यू किया इसकी इसकी आवाज मुझे बहुत पसंद नहीं थी इसलिए मैंने इसके अगेंस्ट में डिसीजन दे दिया राइट दीस काइंड ऑफ डिसीजन वुड बी मोर लाइकली इफ यू डिड नॉट इंसिस्ट दैट जजेस हैव टू एक्सप्लेन द डिसीजन राइट व्हाट हैपेंस इज दैट आप जब भी लिख के अपना व्यू एक्सप्रेस करते एंड थिंक अबाउट योर ओन एक्सपीरियंस जब हम लोग भी जब पेपर लिखते हैं अपने अपने लॉ कोर्स राइट राइटिंग रियली क्लैरिफाइज योर थिंकिंग प्रोसेस राइट राइटिंग हेल्प्स यू आर्टिकुलेट योर थॉट प्रोसेस तो जब आप लिख के अपना डिसीजन देते हो Right. Then it ensures that you have to convince both sides of a case. कि आपने दोनों की बात सुनी है, क्योंकि आपको दोनों का argument summarize करना, दोनों का fact summarize करना है judgement में. So knowing that a judge has to explain the decision in writing ensures कि वो you know दोनों side की बात सुने, दोनों side के fact सुने and अपने मन से मनमानी करके decision ना दे. So that's one important protection you get is that it ensures that arbitrary decisions are not taken by a judge. Right. it ensures application of mind by the judge judicial application of mind that the decision that has been given by the judge is based on established principles of law and and uh, and um, legal principles and case laws that have been previously decided and that ensures that even the losing side is is satisfied with the legitimacy of the process nahi to kya hai ki judicial process ka legitimacy bahut jaldi khatam ho jata hai yadi jo losing party hai वो प्रोसेस में बिलीव नहीं करे तो जो जो पार्टी केस जीत गई है वो तो कुछ होगा ही चाहे आपने नेचुरल जस्टिस फॉलो किया या ना किया नेचुरल जस्टिस का वैल्यू ये रहता है कि इवन द पार्टी विच लूज द केस इज स्टिल सैटिस्फाइड दे स्टिल बिलीव इन इन द लेजिटमेसी ऑफ द प्रोसेस दे स्टिल बिलीव कि मेरे साथ न्याय हुआ है हालांकि मैं केस हार गया मेरे साथ न्याय हुआ क्योंकि प्रोसेस ठीक से फॉलो किया गया एंड स्पीकिंग ऑर्डर इज अ ग्रेट गारंटी इज अ वेरी स्ट्रॉन्ग एश्योरेंस दैट लूजिंग पार्टी के साथ भी न्याय हुआ उनकी भी बात सुनी गई उनके भी फैक्ट सुने गए लीगल एंड लॉजिकल रीजन ऑफ वाई दे डिड नॉट बिन दैट के तो एक्सप्लेनेशन मिलने से ना इवन द लूजिंग पार्टी इज अश्योर्ड कि चलो ठीक है हालांकि मैं केस हार गया कम से कम जज ने मेरी बात को सुनी उसने लीगल प्रोसेस अप्लाई करके एक प्रॉपर लॉजिकल आर्ग्यूमेंट देके मेरी बात को नकारा इसलिए नहीं मैं हार गया कि मैं यू नो मेरा चेहरा उसको पसंद था मेरी आवाज उसको पसंद नहीं थी या मैं जहां से हूँ वो पसंद नहीं था या यू नो कोई भी कहीं कास्ट के रीजन पर रिलीजन के रीजन पर मेरा अगेंस्ट डिस्क्रिमिनेशन हुआ तो ये सब एश्योरेंसेस लूजिंग पार्टी को भी मिलते हैं व्हेन यू इंसिस्ट ऑन स्पीकिंग ऑर्डर एंड व्हिच इज व्हाई इट इज सच एन इंपॉर्टेंट प्रिंसिपल ऑफ नेशनल लॉ दैट एवरी टाइम यू गिव अ डिसीजन व्हिच अफेक्ट्स द राइट्स ऑफ अदर पार्टीज इट मस्ट बी अ स्पीकिंग ऑर्डर इट मस्ट स्पीक फॉर इटसेल्फ इट मस्ट एक्सप्लेन हाउ द जज केम टू अ पर्टिकुलर कंक्लूजन सो लेट्स क्विक quickly summarize the three principles of natural justice the first is that you cannot be a judge in your own court nemo debet asset judex in propria cause the second principle is audio alterum party that you must uh, hear both sides before you uh, decide a, 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 a judicial case and the third is the sand ration we legis the sat it's a leg that reason is the soul of law and so therefore your decisions must be speaking order like one thing, I, i i forgot this when i was talking about the third principle the second assurance you get whenever you insist on speaking order is that you know the exact grounds of appeal aap yadi case haar gaye aur aapko higher court mein appeal karna hai so you know the exact grounds on which you must file your appeal because these are the points on which you lost the case right so uh, uh, that's the other reason why you must uh, you know insist on speaking order uh to to ensure that the legitimacy of the legal process is followed i want to talk about uh certain uh you know, reasons why this is so fundamental to the judicial process in a in a country like why is it that principles of natural justice have the status above statutory law that even when statutes don't explicitly provide for principles of natural justice you must abide by them right you know why is it that this is you know Placed on a higher pedestal than ordinary statutory law. So there are several Supreme Court cases which say that unless the law specifically prohibits the application of principles of natural justice, courts and decision makers must read natural justice into a into the legislature, into the in, into the legislative act, right? into the into the statute. Right? So in the classic example of this is the Swadeshi Cotton Mills case, uh, 1981, where unless there is an express prohibition in the statute that natural justice is exempted courts will be i mean courts and decision makers must read the principles of natural justice into the decision making process into the statute so why is it that this has such a high stature 
uh, in not just Indian democracy, but in democracies around the world. So there are several examples of this, this, uh, this uh, elevated stature of principles of natural justice. Right. So one example of how principles of natural justice have a stature above statutory law is that uh, you know, they are applicable even for non-citizens. So even non-citizens who are uh, you know, convicted for a crime or who, who, whose personal liberty has been denied, who are accused of a crime, they are entitled to principles of natural justice. Right? Uh, so, which is very unique because a lot of fundamental rights are only given to citizens. They are not guaranteed to non-citizens. Very few fundamental rights are guaranteed even to non-citizens, like Article 21. And principles of natural justice must be followed even in cases involving non-citizens who, who, who are being heard before an Indian court. The second example of the sort of the exalted status of, of principles in natural justice is that it is one of the few reasons on which you can refuse to enforce a foreign judgment. Right? Typically, most foreign judgments are binding on legal court and you can enforce foreign judgments through CPC in Indian courts. Section 13 of the CPC which talks about enforcement of foreign judgments, lists very limited grounds on which you can choose not to enforce a foreign judgment in India. So let's quickly look at section 13 of the CPC, which again is a very interesting reference to principles of natural justice in our, in our Indian law. So look at section 13 sub clause B, right, which talks about the grounds on which Foreign, foreign judgment can cannot be uh, enforced. So does someone want to quickly unmute and read section 13D for the benefit of everyone? Just unmute yourself and read section 13 sub clause D. Kunal, you want to unmute and quickly read section 13D? Kunal? Uh, hello. Where the proceedings in which the judgment was obtained are opposed to natural justice. Correct. So think about this that Indian courts will enforce a judgment even though they may have made an error in law. They will enforce a judgment of a foreign court even though they may have made an error in, in sort of gathering rules of evidence. Right. They will enforce a foreign court judgment even if there are different procedural law for both cases in India and in the foreign jurisdiction. They will enforce a foreign court judgment even if there are different substantive law on, on the issue in India and, and, and in the foreign region. So all of these discrepancies, all of these mistakes, differences, diversities will be tolerated by an Indian court and they will be enforced in India. But if the foreign judgment did not follow principles of natural justice, right, then they will not be enforced in a court of law. So courts in India will tolerate all kinds of errors by foreign courts and still enforce a judgment in Indian jurisdiction. They will allow errors of collecting and hearing evidence, errors of procedural law, errors of substantive law, differences in you know, the, the trial process. All of those things are fine with Indian courts. But if you violate the principle of natural justice, then you cannot enforce those foreign judgments in, a, in an Indian court. And the reason is that if you don't guarantee principles of natural justice, right, it is the clearest sign that the decision was taken in an arbitrary way. And, and you know, if you think about the three principles of natural justice, you know, rule against bias, hearing both sides, and seeking order, ultimately these are actually protections against arbitrary. Right? The lack of any of these safeguards in the judicial process indicates that there's a very high likelihood that something arbitrary happened in the judicial process process of a particular case. And so one reason why they have such a high stature in Indian law principles and natural justice have you know, application even if the statute does not explicitly provide to it because they are very, very intrinsic to the uh, you know the, the protections guaranteed in the Article 14. Article 14 of our constitution, remember, equality before law is also a principle against arbitrariness. We've uh, sort of uh, studied this in, in the fundamental rights discussion in our respective constitutional law courts. That Article 14 is a constitutional guarantee against arbitrariness by our decision makers. 
and principles of natural justice are also protections against arbitrariness in a decision making which affects our rights so therefore if you don't follow principles of natural justice it is a clear violation of article 14 of our constitution right because the absence of natural justice is a clear sign that there was some arbitrariness in the judicial process by which a judge gave a decision and so there is almost a constitutional a fundamental rights protection given for principles of natural justice because there is this link between article 14 arbitrariness and principles of natural justice right but it is important to know that principles of natural justice are not created by our constitution right article 14 only acts as the constitutional guardian of principles of natural justice it's not as if we did not have natural justice in india before article 14 was included in our indian constitution article 14 simply is the constitutional guardian of these principles which have been recognized and been followed for a long period of time in indian history and this distinction was made very very explicitly in the mehta gandhi case and mehta gandhi case made case the famous uh, 1978 it made it very clear that article 14 is simply a constitutional guardian of natural justice it does not create principles of natural justice in in india the mehta gandhi case is important for a lot of other reasons also as far as the discussion of natural justice is concerned because it was the case which enshrined the principle that natural justice is simply fair play in action right? so you know it simply humanizes the legal process and therefore even though the statute may not explicitly provide so you must still read principle of natural justice whenever you are interpreting a statute because these principles ultimately make law fair right and so this assumption about natural justice that you must read natural justice even in statutes where where they are not explicitly stated comes from the mehta gandhi case and so for those of us who are interested in the topic of natural justice mehta gandhi case is a very very important case to study right because that clarified two important propositions about natural justice one is that article 14 is the constitutional guardian of of natural justice and two is that because natural justice is so fundamental to making law fair it, it's almost like fair play in action therefore you must read principles of natural justice even when the statute doesn't explicitly provide so um, i don't want to go into the details of the mehta gandhi case because i think we are running slightly short on time i want to sort of uh, we have about 10 minutes to go in the lecture and i want to focus that on talking about certain controversies limitations issues around principles of natural justice that have come up one of the earliest issues relating to the application of principles of natural justice in indian law what whether you should apply principles of natural justice only to judicial cases or also to administrative proceedings also right because for a long time the guiding principle in 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 jurisprudence was that principles of natural justice have to be followed only in judicial cases and not in administrative acts not in administrative proceedings right the first conceptual argument the first conceptual pushback against the limited use of natural justice came in the uh, in the famous case of provincial pictures house versus wednesbury a 1941 47 case where which gave rise to what we call the wednesbury principle of natural justice it said that let us not look at the labeling of action so let us not say if an action is labeled as a judicial act it must adhere to natural justice and if an action is labeled as an administrative act natural justice does not apply so in in this very very important case associated provincial picture house versus wednesbury uh, you know the lord green you know made the proposition and let us not be very very uh, you know stringent let us not be very very finicky about the the nature of the action uh, whether it is judicial or administrative to decide whether natural justice should apply we should take a step back and ask the broader principle does this person have discretionary power and will this discretionary power affect this the legal rights of citizens in a country if you have discretionary power and if your exercise of power has legal consequences for citizens in a country then as a general rule principles of natural justice should be followed by you it is irrelevant whether you label that 
discretionary power as judicial power or administrative power. The next important conceptual pushback against the use of natural justice only for judicial cases and not for administrative cases came from the landmark case of uh, Ridge versus Baldwin. Uh, Ridge versus Baldwin is an important case because that was the case that was used in Kripak by Supreme Court also to make the argument that we should no longer distinguish between administrative cases and uh, legal and, and judicial cases and we should apply principles of natural justice wherever uh, there is, a, you know, there is a use of discretionary power which has consequences for legal rights. So, Ridge versus Baldwin, the 1963 case by the UK House of Lords, is a is the very very it's an important landmark decision on on principles of natural justice. Usme kya hua tha ki ek uh, police officer tha, he had been convicted of a crime. So the 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 police authority, the, the, the jurisdiction where he was posted, Brighton, Brighton, Turkey province the UK. So the Brighton Police Authority removed him from service without giving him an opportunity to present his case. So they took disciplinary action against this police officer and they removed him without giving him an option to present his case on why he should not be dismissed from police service. So this case went to the House of Lords and in that case for the first time the House of Lords laid out the principle that even in administrative proceedings you must apply principles of natural justice. And the moment they allowed principles of natural justice to be used in administrative proceedings Automatically, even executive actions came under the uh, control of judicial review. So, the moment you read principles of natural justice into executive acts, automatically it allowed courts to judicially review not just acts of legislature but acts of the legislature. And which is why, even in the Mena Gandhi case, when the question was whether the process by which Mena Gandhi's passport was taken was correct or not, which was an executive action, the Supreme Court was was allowed to use principles of natural justice to decide an executive action using the rationale of Ridge versus Bald. So, uh, you know, in, even in the development of jurisprudence on natural justice in India, Ridge versus Baldwin, the 1960 case, is a very, very important case. And it, for the first time, so the Kripat case, Mega Gandhi case, for the first time, using inspiration from Ridge versus Baldwin, made the, made the conclusion that even in administrative cases, you must, you must uh, use principle of natural justice with certain exceptions, you know, like one exception was that if if the statute expressly prohibits you from doing so, then only in those limited cases can you choose to not, uh, uh, you know, apply principles of natural justice. And I mean, the most important case on that is the Swadeshi Cotton Mills versus Union of India, the 1981 case. The other uh, sort of exception that has been carved out to the application of natural justice over sub, sub, you know, sub, successive court judgments. And we don't have the time to go into detail of all of those judgments which have carved out exceptions to uh, natural justice. But one sort of exception is, is on grounds of expediency. That if you know, the facts of the case are so blatantly clear, right? If, if the facts clearly speak for themselves and you know, no purpose will be served by hearing the other side because everyone knows what happened. In those limited cases, Right, you can choose to not strictly be bound by principles of natural justice. When only one conclusion is possible and only one penalty is permissible, that the conclusion is irrefutable on a clear look, on a cursory look at the facts. And based on that conclusion, only one punishment is possible. And in those limited cases, you can choose to dilute the requirement of adhering to principles of natural justice. However, if there is even slight debate about the conclusion from facts, if there is even a slight amount of discretion on the penalty or the punishment you can impose, in those cases, as far as possible, the decision maker must accommodate principles of natural justice. And so, while you can use expediency as a ground, that you know, time is very low, if we haven't done anything, then the case will be closed. So, in those rare cases, you can exempt from natural justice. Right. But that exemption must be as limited as possible. So as far as possible, every time you're exercising a discretionary power to affect the legal rights of a citizen, you must try to adhere to principles of natural justice. So you know, there have been several restrictions. You know, it's an evolving debate in our judiciary on the extent to which principles of natural justice 
should be followed, right? So, for example, if a decision was taken by the government without following principle of natural justice, can you ratify that decision by giving a post decisional hearing? कि चलो मैंने decision लेते हैं वक्त तो नहीं follow किया, but decision के बाद मैंने एक opportunity दिया दोनों side को अपना argue case रखने के लिए and then I decide. Is that okay to ratify? Uh, you know, a, a compromise with principles of natural justice. So that's another debate that is constantly going on. One other regular, you know, per perennial debate in in our, in our judiciary is whether a decision taken in violation of principles of natural justice is it void or voidable? Right. So can you can the government or can the judicial authority or the executive authority can they take certain steps after the decision? To fix the errors of natural justice, right? Or whether the very fact that you violated principles of natural justice makes a makes a judicial or an administrative order void ab initio. Right? So again, there are certain complexities in the practical application of principles of natural justice. But I thought I'd just give you an overarching, almost a bird's eye view of uh, how principles of natural justice have have played out uh, in in our Supreme Court and how they have guided the decision making process. So to quickly summarize, I we first spoke about the Three principles of natural justice, and we gave some illustrations of how those principles apply and the value of each of these. Why is it that these are so fundamental that even when the statute doesn't say so, we read them into the the case laws and we read them into the statutes of passed by our parliament. Then we spoke about the exalted state of principles of natural justice. That why they are, have a have a higher sort of standing in in our in our uh, legal process. Than ordinary statutory law, and so and then we spoke about how it's applicable even for non-citizens. That it's one of the limited grounds on which foreign judgments can be can can be refused to be enforced in 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 our court. Right? We spoke about the link between Article 14 and principles of of natural justice. Right? Um, and finally, we spoke about certain uh, debates, important debates on on the on the limits of principles of natural justice. So one important debate is whether they are applicable only to judicial cases or even to administrative courts. and that debate has been cleared ever since uh, the cripa case that you know even administrative proceedings must adhere to principle of natural justice as far as possible and simply because the administrative process becomes more cumbersome is no excuse to exempt principles of natural justice and then we you know then the other big debate that we spoke about was uh, can you limit principles of natural justice if the statute expressly provides so and the answer is that yes in those limited cases under the swadeshi cotton mill case you can choose to uh, you know exclude principle of natural justice but only if the statute expressly provides and then finally we spoke about certain cases of expediency right when the facts are so clear that only one conclusion is possible or there is a time constraint right um, like in those limited cases some dilution from adherence to principle of natural justice is allowed by our courts and the decision making process so i think i have spoken a lot over the last one hour Uh, this is again i say only a bird's eye view so each of these points is a separate lecture in itself but uh, due to constraints of time i i'd like to stop here and see if we can have uh, a few questions and maybe have a discussion on this so guru back to you oh uh, thank you so much apoor that was such a delight to listen to the lecture on natural justice and the journey of the supreme court and how supreme court on various occasion through the decades of our uh, sort of judicial history interpreted the the principles of national justice time and again the house is now open mai uh, isi ke sath house open karta hu aur agar kisi ko bhi is prakar ka koi prashn hai koi observation hai koi remark hai to aap ya to hand raise kar sakte hain fir mai aapko unmute karke mauka dunga dusra tarika hai ki chat box mein apne prashn aap de sakte hain any one of us have any sort of questions uh raj go ahead uh sir i have a question i know that my question uh, uh may uh, might sound bizarre but uh, uh, it is regarding anjex sir like in recent past what we saw that the supreme court declared the uh, act unconstitutional so suppose a situation where a judge is uh, the judge who is deciding the case is getting uh, benefited by the collegial system or is about to get uh, benefits from that So in that scenario, uh, do you think that it is violation of the first principle of natural justice, like uh, rule of bias, or even if uh, the principles of uh, natural justice is not applicable on judicial proceedings, is it fair? Uh, what's your take on it? Uh, so that's uh, again, that's a that's a one of those 
पॉइंट वन केस बोल रहा हैसेस में रूल अप्लाइज पॉइंट वन केसेस वेर यू नो देर इज एन एक्सेप्शन एंड समटाइम्स दैट एक्सेप्शन मेक्स दी लॉ सो एनजे एनजैक वॉज द क्लासिक एग्जाम्पल ऑफ वेर दिसीजन मेकिंग अथॉरिटी ऑल्सो हैड अर्सन स्टेक बट इफ यू डोंट अलाउ द सुप्रीम कोर्ट टू जुडिशली रिव्यू an act of the parliament right then it leads to a you know a constitutional uh, crisis right and so that is a that is one of those rare examples where you know you 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 don't disregard you don't dilute but you simply say that principles of natural justice are not applicable just as you know in policy decisions right so let's say an is officer who who constantly make policy decisions in various government departments right now they bureaucrats both make the policy and implement the policy right but you can't say that a bureaucrat is violating principles of natural justice because the same person who made the policy is also implementing right? because so if your if there is a subject matter uh, you know overlap between the decision maker and the issue at hand right typically a limited a more limited view of natural justice is taken if there is a subject matter overlap so you can't say that an is officer will be biased simply because the same person who made the policy is implementing similarly you can't say that the judiciary will be uh, will be will be biased the supreme court will be biased because the policy that they are deciding is 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 one that you know affects affects uh, the institution But typically the question that you you know in in those cases specifically in jack the question is not more about the institutional bias but about the personal bias of the judge right so aap सब्जेक्ट मैटर को यूज करके यदि आप नेचुरल जस्टिस का एक वाइड एप्लीकेशन करेंगे तो बहुत सारे डिसीजन हैं जो कि यू नो जिनका कोई लॉजिकल कंक्लूजन नहीं होता सिर्फ गवर्नमेंट की पॉलिसी डिसीजन हो गई अब यू नो केसेस इन सुप्रीम कोर्ट इज इटसेल्फ अ पार्ट सो दैट वाज रिमेंबर दिस क्वेश्चन ऑफ द जजेस शुड फॉल अंडर पब्लिक अथॉरिटी और नॉट दैट दे शुड डिस्क्लोज देयर एसेट्स एंड मेडिकल रिकॉर्ड तो उसमें सुप्रीम कोर्ट आल्सो फाइल्ड अ केस बिफोर द दिल्ली हाई कोर्ट सो वी मस्ट मेक अ डिस्टिंक्शन बिटवीन द इंस्टीट्यूशनल ड्यूटी of someone who's taking a decision the institutional role of of someone who's taking a decision and the role of the people behind that institution who are making making the decision right? so there is a distinction between uh, the the subject matter agenda of the institution and the personal biases of the individual behind that institution so that is why you would not want to say ki nahi natural justice will be violated if supreme court hears the petition and just so ultimately as an institution supreme court has the mandate to judicially review all acts of the parliament right? and that subject matter overlap cannot be called a violation of principle of natural justice right? so that i think that's my unsatisfactory but limited answer and and you must understand that these are some of the practical challenges of implement, implementing natural justice in a democracy like a country but it's a great question you know very 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 interesting question thank you sir रवि शंकर जी का एक ऑब्जर्वेशन है चैट बॉक्स में आप पूर्व एक बार देखिएगा हाँ सो जस्टिस रंजन गोगो इस केस इज एक्चुअली यू नो फैसिनेटिंग केस आई आई हैड इट वाज नो सॉर्ट ऑफ फॉर्मल लीगल जजमेंट सो आई डेंट वांट टू सॉर्ट ऑफ टॉक अबाउट इट बट देर आर सेवरल लैंडमार्क केसेज दैट आई थॉट आई मैं बट Not only brought up Justice Gogoi's case. Remember, the Justice Ramanna was part of the original uh, sort of bench that was investigating uh, the, the allegation. So it, you had uh, Justice Bobde, Justice Indra Banerjee, and Justice Ramanna. Now, the plaintiff made the arg- argument that Justice Ramanna is very close friends with uh, Justice Bobde, with, with uh, Justice, Justice Gogoi, Justice Ramanna. is very very close friends with justice uh, gogoi and so him being on the disciplinary committee might influence the decision making of the committee itself right to which justice ramanna took serious objection he in fact gave a very famous speech in hyderabad and if you are interested you can quickly google that speech by justice ramanna when he said that you no know, anyway judges are a small knit community hum log sab parties mein sab meeting mein jaate nahi aapas mein to aisa nahi hai ki main kisi judge ke ghar mein regularly jata hu to mere mitra hain kyunki har judge ek dusre ke ghar mein regularly jata hai so that by itself cannot be an argument that i am a close friend of justice gogoi however he said that to ensure that the legitimacy of the process is not questioned you know remember that say that justice must not simply be done but must be seen to be done that it is not enough that you substantively have done justice but the perception must be created that justice was also done and so to protect the perception of justice and to protect 
the principles in article justice i will withdraw from from this uh, panel and then for indu malhotra justice indu malhotra was then replaced instead of uh, justice ramana and he made it very clear that he has strong objection to these allegations that he is a personal friend and so he be biased saying that despite my strong reservation right you know to avoid suspicion and to, to avoid dilution of principles in article justice i am violating from uh, i am i'm stepping down from this from this committee and uh, you know he and then this is uh, i think this indu malhotra was appointed to to replace uh, even the saturday hearing which happened right uh, that, about which a lot of questions are that he was part of the bench that heard the allegation that the first instance in a extraordinary saturday morning hearing right? he simply heard the hearing and then uh, you know he left midway and actual order was only passed by justice mishra and justice khanna so while you know that was still not clearly in a there is a principle in article justice the three judges who first heard the allegations in the saturday morning uh, hearing after after the, the allegations first came to light right they were still aware that we should not create the perception that principle of natural justice are not being violated so halfway through the hearing right when when justice bogoy had heard the allegation against him and he had responded after that when the judicial process started he withdrew from the bench and he was not part of the order that was passed actually by justice mishra and justice khanna so you know again it's it's like raj rajesh question uh, you know this is another classic example of the practical implementation of of implement of of, of uh, adhering to principle of natural justice in a messy democracy like india right? so there is always a difference between theory and practice and and all that we can do as consciente citizens is minimize the gap between theory and practice and that is what it means to be in a healthy democracy Uh, yeah thank you so much purva i would uh, i think we are uh, good now i would now now request uh, my colleague and uh, faculty member at post graduate department of law ms ruchi singh to please give her concluding remarks and also the vote of thanks ruchi ma'am over to you ma'am i think you are on mute yeah am i audible now uh, so thank you apur sir i think this was indeed a very very useful in fact extremely useful session for me also personally because let me first tell you i do administrative law comparative administrative law and also a part of procedural law where we use a lot of cases you know which are decided or we talk about we bring in natural justice every year and there while we teach but the way you took it it was really very useful because uh, like we did not know so much uh, about how judges have recused themselves or you know looking at novartis case all together from a natural justice perspective etc so it was indeed very useful i'm very sure all our students have benefited from it and it together gave uh, it all together has given them a different uh, insight on natural justice and now they know to use it in a better way in all other uh, case, uh, subjects like administrative law and other things procedural laws so thank you apurb sir and uh, i would like to tell our students like apurb sir is also faculty at ashoka university and he had been like because few of our students are also there so we uh, like he's doing really great and you all are very privileged to have a one hour lecture series with him i on the behalf of patna university family and the post graduate department of law patna university thank you apur sir and thank you all my dear students and guru sir for coordinating this series and today is the day one for our lecture series we going to organize many more and it was really nice of you sir apur sir for taking like coming out with this insight and giving us your time thank you once again thank you from all of us thank you ma'am thank you guru and thank you dr javed for hosting her uh, great time uh, yeah the, the, there is a brief announcement for my students tomorrow please be on time the lecture is going to be on the topic of judicial review and constitutionalism uh, a comparative perspective and it's going to be delivered by shri raghav pande who is raghav. an professor at maharashtra national university bombay and a fellow at the india foundation thank you so much apur really grateful to have you with us uh, for this lecture and uh, For my students, I think all of you should know that Apoor 
is a native of bihar is a native of darbhanga and he keeps coming to bihar so whenever he is in uh, patna next time we'll definitely catch hold of him and uh, organize a physical session so that he can actually have a more meaningful uh, and a better uh, deliberation in the future thank you so much students and please be on time tomorrow thank you so much bilkul bilkul thank you thank you a lot for this bye bye thank you so much